Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to another discussion of a film in this sort of uh, less edited, less uh, scripted format. I did one of these, uh, the first one, uh, last week, and you can watch that by clicking the link in the description below or by clicking the annotation card appearing somewhere on your screen at this very moment. Today we are going to be talking about the 1922 film Hexen, directed by Benjamin Christensen. This is a Swedish-Danish uh, film, Benjamin Christensen being Danish, but he was lured over by Swedish production companies uh, with the promise of full creative control, which is a very good thing he got, because I can imagine a film as uh, sort of controversial as this was, and to an extent still is. Uh, it's very uh, impressive, and I'm very glad that he did retain that creative control. Now, the reason I wanted to discuss this film today is for many reasons, but I think the main one is that this film has a very uh, impressive and some would say even unique ability to be, yes, a silent film, but one that is still able to this day, I think, to entertain and engage uh, wide audiences. I think that uh, you don't have to be a cinephile or someone who necessarily would sit down and watch a silent film uh, in order to enjoy this or to get a to, to appreciate uh, its intelligence. And so I wanted to talk about this because I feel like uh, anyone on the internet could click on this video and I feel like the majority of people who could click on this video would also not only enjoy the video maybe, but also could be capable of enjoying and appreciating this film. The wonderful thing about Hexen is that it doesn't have a story. Uh, it is essentially one of the first real examples of the essay film. And for 1922, this is the still exploration period as to what uh, cinema, what the camera can evoke from an audience. And this is still in that sort of uh, experimental era. And so since this film doesn't have a traditional plot, uh, it's kind of difficult for me to evaluate what is and isn't considered spoilers for this. So I'm just going to go ahead and call it uh, for this video mild spoilers throughout. Uh, what I mean by that is I recommend you all go and watch this before watching this review, but if you are on the fence if you want to watch it or if you don't really care about kind of getting a few things spoiled. I don't think that if you watch this review first and then watch the film, I don't think this will ruin the experience per se, but I always recommend uh, going in blind as the truest experience of the film. So all of that out of the way, I think I am just going to go ahead and start with sort of a overview of the uh, quote-unquote plot of the film. Uh, it's broken into seven parts, seven acts, and uh, the Criterion Blu-ray, which I have here, uh, named them. I'm not sure if these names are from Criterion or if they were approved by the director or if they were part of the original release. I have no clue. So the first part is called Intro, and it is a very uh, potentially off-putting uh, beginning to the film. I feel like if you aren't uh, going into this with the right mindset, uh, you might be immediately sort of uh, turned off by this opening because it is essentially a PowerPoint presentation through a series of inner titles and uh, actual pictures and models. Uh, the Benjamin Christensen, who sort of is the voice of the narrator, even though it's, <laughs> it's written, so it's not much of a voice, but you get what I mean. Uh, he sort of describes how people in the 1400s and, uh, I mean, that date isn't necessarily specified, but it's around that time, and how they sort of believed in witchcraft. And if I, if you haven't figured it out yet, this film is about uh, witchcraft and sort of the uh, witch trial era, which uh, you might be familiar with in America with something like the Salem witch trials, but this is obviously Sweden, Denmark, other countries. And so the intro is essentially a overview of what the film is going to show in more depth later on, but it's only shown through a series of actual photographs from historical documents. I mean, they're, they're not photographs, they're drawing illustrations, I should say. And they sort of display uh, how people thought witches, witches behaved, uh, how they were determined to be witches, uh, 
what would happen when they decided someone was a witch or when someone confessed even to being a witch, uh, sort of what their ceremonies were, how they sort of would uh, fly around at night and uh, meet with the devil and eat corpses from the gallows. It's very, uh, <laughs> I mean, it, there is sort of a almost darkly comical tone to the entire film uh, because of how absurd we all know uh, that type of thing is in reality. The intro acts not only as an intro, but also sort of a summary of everything you see in the film. Not uh, necessarily all of it, but sort of a overview more so than an intro, I think. And so then the second part is called 1488, which is the year uh, I assume the majority of the film takes place. This is the part that gives us our first introduction into what the film is, which largely is a reenactment, or a series of reenactments, uh, of people from that time period, and sort of the very real things that would go on, but also blended in flawlessly, are these extended fantasy sequences, and the sort of imagined reality, and that's the majority of the um, sort of more striking visual uh, aspects which you can see like on the cover like there's a demon guy i mentioned how people thought that like witches would go and meet with the devil in like some magical place and they would fly away and meet with the devil and eat the corpses of the gallows and that's brought up in the intro but then we actually see not only these women during the daytime but then we see this fantasy reenacted as if it is the reality and that is sort of the most interesting aspects of this film, is the blending of reality, fantasy, delusion, these imagined sequences on top of the fantasy sequences. And this is the part that introduces us into all of that. We get to see uh, a witch give someone a love potion, and we see a fantasy, an imagined fantasy sequence of the girl who she gives that potion to, and we see... But it's played out just as if it was really happening, or as it presents the actual reality to us. And we see the love potion uh, working splendidly, but then we cut back to the reality. And then later in, the, and later in this part, even, we see the witch, the witch going to sleep. And then we have this fantastic uh, dream sequence full of these incredibly memorable uh, special effects including a life-size pig dancing with all of these maidens and such. And it sort of depicts this sad picture of this sort of old woman who is reduced to nothing but a witch. There isn't anything else she can be, really. And this again acts as sort of an introduction into what the bulk of the film is actually going to be, which is the blending of reality, delusion, fantasy, the made-up reality. And so the next three parts, which are called the trials, torture, and sinful thoughts, are the closest we get to a continuing story. And these three parts sort of demonstrate uh, how a witch can be called out and how the hysteria and lack of logical thinking sort of could lead to all of this destruction and horrible destruction. And it sort of explains in an incredibly intelligent and clever way uh, how, um, you know, all these thousands and thousands of people really did believe that by killing these women, they were ridding the world of some, you know, demonic presence. And it's incredibly, these three parts especially, very intelligent in how it doesn't, although there is lots of uh, Christensen's narration through the intertitles, there is still very much a the majority of the messaging is done in these three parts i mean is done through the storytelling and it's incredibly it's not overbearing it's not like preaching it's very clever as i say and it's built right into the plot and it's so well crafted especially in these three parts which i'm not going to get because like i said this is the closest we get to a plot so i'm not going to spoil this I'm going to leave these three parts open, but it's basically about how a printer's family is ruined because uh, one of them accuses someone, not even in the family, of witchcraft. And then the sixth part, called Techniques, uh, sort of is 
beginning to wrap up the film uh, before its final part, which is probably my favorite, I think. Uh, it sort of wraps up, it brings in a bit more, not preaching, as I said, it, but it brings back Christensen's narration in sort of a more informative and sort of uh, direct way. He sort of talks about how, well, what about all of the women who confess to witchcraft? Even though it touches on that in the previous parts, it sort of, in, in case there was any form of confusion, which it's hard to see how there could be, as to what the three plot parts uh, sort of meant. It sort of cleans up the edges, perhaps, in this uh, second to last part. Sort of talks about, you know, how the device, the torture devices, which were used on these women accused of witchcraft, and how uh, he even, it, it has it has several fourth wall breaks. It's incredibly meta as well. He sort of talks about how one of the actresses on the film uh, wanted to use one of the torture devices uh, just to see uh, what would happen. And he said, uh, there's an inner title that says, after like three seconds with the, what was it, thumb screw or whatever, uh, I'm not even going to say what horrible secrets she told me. And so it sort of talks about how like lots of these things which are recorded and even depicted as the truth in this film in these fantastical sequences are nothing more than just fabrications that were just sort of made under this extreme pressure. And of course, this all leads into the culmination, uh, if you will, of the film, the final part to 1921, which was the year, uh, though it was released in 1922, that was when it was uh, in production. And I'll talk about the production in a bit because that's also very interesting. But um, 1922 ties the film, the events of the film in 1488, ties them to then modern day. Now this is where the intelligence and uh, cleverness and uniqueness of the film really shines. In a lot of ways, this film was beyond ahead of its time. In a lot of ways, it is in 2020 ahead of its time. Because it ties in not only... Not only does it explain how all of this witchcraft stuff uh, sort of happened in history, this horrible, horrible stuff, not only does it explain the logic behind it, but it also ties it into modern day and how mental illness and what he called hysteria, I mean, now we would have a more uh, direct term for it, and how it sort of parallels these uh, attributes which would have, at the time, in 1488, been called witchcraft. And the film makes comparisons to many mental disorders as sort of uh, the exact equivalent of what we were just shown going on in 1400s. And we can sort of realize that in a lot of ways, uh, there's still lots of criticisms to be made on then modern society in still treating these mental illnesses as something sort of not understood and sort of not to be touched. And it sort of is incredibly profound in that way. So I think that'll serve as sort of the summary of the events in this film. Uh, obviously, just go and watch it if you're interested. I hope I sort of uh, incited many of you to go check it out. But if not, that's okay too, I guess. But you're missing out. I do want to go back and talk about that opening, the PowerPoint presentation. I mentioned it was kind of off-putting at first for many people, myself included. But upon re-watching it, it is incredible. I've watched this film like three or four times now. It is incredibly intelligent. And uh, even though it doesn't seem like it, it's an incredibly smart way to open this sort of vast exploration of witchcraft in that it sort of gives you everything you need to know and you get all of the information that you would have gotten from watching the 105 minute movie all in that first part like you don't necessarily learn any new information after that part it just builds upon that foundation and sort of goes backwards in a lot of ways and that might sound like a bad thing or like an amateur mistake or something but I would like to point out that there is a 1941 sort of indie film. Not many people have heard of it. It's called uh, Citizen Kane. And this indie film opens with sort of a news package summarizing Charles Foster Kane's life in just this short uh, five-minute period of time. And you could turn off the movie right then, and you would learn 
maybe a few things about uh, Charles Foster Kane's life in more detail you would learn about it if you watch the whole movie. But you could turn it off after that five minutes and you would still have a pretty fair understanding of this man's life. Now, the reason I compare those two is because it is an incredibly intelligent way to let the audience not be uh, confused while you're delivering all of these messages. Something like Citizen Kane, I think, would be very hard to follow with something so dense as this man's entire life. Uh, you wouldn't be able to keep up, but because it opens with this news package summarizing the events, you can kind of uh, follow along when it goes a bit more in-depth into everything. You can sort of follow it a lot easier, and I think that ties in with the overview. You're sort of, you don't get, it allows you to not get swept away in sort of the mysticism of it as you see it happen. You've already heard it, you already know all this, now you can focus on the sort of deeper meanings, the progression of the events, you can focus on what this is trying to say. And I think that is the importance of that opening. So the actual substance of the film is this incredible ride through the nightmare that was the Middle Ages for many people. And it sort of features the historical reality, the beliefs from the people of the time, like what they thought was going on, and then these fantasies of the people in the historical reality, and it just blends all of them, goes back and forth and in and out, and it's almost hard to keep up with uh, what's real and what's not. And all of this is sort of intercut with the objectivity of the tone of the inner titles, and the constant fourth wall breaks and such makes it for such a unique viewing experience as you're sort of flowing in and out of reality. Now I should say that up until 1968 this film was banned in the United States as well as uh, several other countries I think. Now this film does contain imagery which uh, some would say would be uh, sacrilege or uh, some could even watch this film and take away an anti-religion or specifically anti-Christianity uh, message. And because of this the film was banned uh, in the United States until 1968. And although... I could understand, you know, some audience members uh, are uncomfortable by the imagery, which is uh, understandable. I mean, a lot of it is uh, quite disturbing. But calling this an anti-religion uh, or anti-Christian film is uh, just as ridiculous as the uh, events that happen in the film. It's pointing out all of these uh, horrific but also absurd uh, things. Like I mentioned, there is sort of a extremely like darker than dark comical tone over the entire thing because you're seeing these people getting you know murdered by the thousands over these completely you know ridiculous things and accusations and there's you know no logic to it there's no proceedings i mean i mentioned that in the uh summary of the plot and especially especially they mention this in the techniques section and there is a comparison to be made uh as someone who is in the American high school education system, uh, I think that a lot of people are familiar with, or might even have been already reminded of, the book The Crucible. Uh, I don't remember the author or the year it came out, but pretty much every high schooler had to read that book. And there is sort of a comparison to be made in that it sort of uh, makes. A commentary on the absurdities of the witch trials but uh where the crucible fails and this excels is the deeper meaning behind a lot of this uh the crucible of course um was meant to draw comparisons to the whole red scare uh, mccarthyism whereas this uh more plays up to the mental health in modern day uh well then modern day but it's it still is incredibly effective today as well and so I find, for one, this to be incredibly more uh, timeless and, in a lot of ways, more profound. And in fact, there is a quote in the essay included in the film, which I'm going to read. And the quote reads, Christensen made a radical decision to present his research and his ideas on screen, not in one or two dramatized case studies, but as a cultural history lecture in moving pictures mingling historical documents and reenactments. And that's another way in which this film is sort of above the crucible, in my opinion. Its presentation is not just one of 
a simple story which you can draw connections to. It is one that is incredibly uh, experimental at the time and in a lot of ways still is unique to say the least. And so now if you'll indulge me, I do want to sort of talk about some of the things on this uh, Criterion uh, Blu-ray. Uh, first, I did want to just talk about the artwork for a second. I mean, just look at that. That is some pretty quality artwork. The, present, the presentation of this Blu-ray is top-notch, to say the least. And the special features I also just sort of wanted to discuss. Uh, the Blu-ray is the new 2K digital restoration, so that would be 1440p uh, for the technical uh, aspects, for people that care about that. There's an audio commentary track, which I haven't had the chance to listen to yet, but I'm sure it's quite good. And then there's something that I wanted to talk about, Witchcraft Through the Ages 1968, a 76-minute version of Hexen, narrated by author William S. Burroughs. Now this is, like I said, the film was banned in America until 1968. This was its sort of mainstream release, a cut-down, edited version that had a bit of narration. As it was 68, no one wanted to watch a silent film. And so that is, I do say, uh, be careful when you go to watch this film, as you might be watching the cut-down, uh, sort of boring, more boring... I mean, I watched this uh, cut-down version just to see what it was like, um, and while it's not necessarily as bad as it could be, it is still nowhere near as good as the original. And so make sure, when you go to watch this film, make sure you are watching the version that is 105 minutes long, or somewhere in that range, and not 76 minutes long. And uh, this sort of also leads to some confusion about the title, as this is just called Hexen. This is stylized, I should say, as just Hexen. But I know on something like uh, HBO Max, for instance, uh, still just calls the uncut version Hexen Witchcraft Through the Ages. And so if you're in America and you're watching the an American version, uh, American release of this, you have to be mindful uh, that it might be called something different, but just make sure you're watching that 105 minute runtime. That's the only thing that matters, really. And another great, great feature on this, which I just watched recently in preparation for this video, is an introduction to the 1941 re-release from director Benjamin Christensen. Now, obviously, you can actually hear his voice this time, and he gives an amazing, illuminating uh, introduction to this film, which I highly recommend. If you can find somewhere, uh, I know I couldn't find it on YouTube. I looked for it, but if I mean, it's almost it's not worth <laughs> buying the Blu-ray for that alone. But it is incredible. And it adds entirely new light onto the film. It's, it's almost like a DLC package, almost. It's like uh, an additional chapter to the film. And he also uh, talks a bit about uh, the importance of silent films versus sound films. And that, I think, also is incredibly uh, illuminating and important to hear. And so I also want to talk about, uh, again, with the presentation. I mean, just look at this. Look at that. But I also wanted to talk about the essay collection. It has, I believe, three essays. Or is it just two? It's either two or three uh, essays in this booklet. But the essay I wanted to sort of discuss is called The Real Unreal. And I'm actually going to include a link in the description for those who want to read it in full. It is by Chris uh, Fujiara. I don't know how to say that. I did not... I did not research how to say that name. That is just my blind read, and I apologize if that is wrong. Um, but I did want to read a excerpt from this. And the quote I'm going to read from this essay is actually a direct quotation from uh, Christensen's uh, notes. or He wrote like an article during the production of the film. And it reads... I would like to know at this time whether a film is able to hold the public's interest without mass effects, without sentimentality, without suspense, without heroes or heroines. In short, without all those things in which a good film is otherwise constructed. My film consists of a series of episodes that, as a part of the mosaic, give expression to an idea. 
And that, I think, is the true appeal of this film and importance and historical significance of this film. I do think this is a historic film. And I think that it is, uh, without a doubt, uh, one that uh, you should all look into uh, watching at least once. I guess a couple other things just to sort of uh, wrap this up. Um, production, I sort of mentioned how it was kind of an interesting thing. Uh, revolutionary special effects, which you can see, uh, I mean, even from just from the cover alone, uh, a lot of these effects create this dreamlike uh, experience, surreal at times. And these are due to state-of-the-art effects, which Christensen uh, spent, like I said, this was produced, or it was made in 1921, but didn't get a release until 22. Uh, and a lot of that is due to these cutting edge, for the time period, special effects. And another interesting thing is that they would only shoot, or Christensen would only shoot at night or in dark environments. And this is unheard of for the time period. Uh, and But he insisted on it, and it really creates a good tone. And like I said, it adds to that almost surrealist uh, layer to the entire film. Uh, one last thing I guess I should mention is another warning for about uh, what you watch for this film. Uh, the music for this Criterion Blu-ray is music from the 1922 Danish premiere arranged by the film music specialist Gillian B. Anderson. Now, the music in this version is sort of like almost playful at times. It's not what you would expect from a traditional oh, like gothic horror, or from the time period even. Uh, and so, but I am also aware that there are many, many other different versions of the score. I know there is one from uh, the Swedish composer Matty Bai that is also, uh, he did the score for The Phantom Carriage, which I have over there, but um, I think that I've only ever watched the film with this score, so I guess I can imagine that it would be an entirely different experience if it had this sort of heavy, like, ominous score throughout. Maybe the sort of dark comedy would almost be missed by the viewer, uh, depending on the score. So just be mindful of that. Uh, if you maybe aren't enjoying this film as much as you think you would, or if you're not getting the same experience as I am describing, it might be due to that. So yeah, I think I'm going to uh, wrap it up with that. Uh, overall, this film is a masterpiece of uh, the silent era, but as I said, it transcends the time period and its importance as an essay film and its uh, legacy on horror as a genre, especially this gothic horror with all of these striking visuals and, sur as I mentioned, surrealist elements. It is beyond uh, appreciation. You cannot truly appreciate how much uh, this film has affected uh, cinema throughout the ages. I think that's going to be it. I've been recording for quite a while now. I've had, a, this is my actually my second day filming this. I've had some serious difficulty getting this one out. Uh, hopefully uh, in the future, if I do more of these, uh, they'll get a bit easier to do. But uh, until then, uh, thank you all for watching. Uh, please check out this film. And that's about it.